Hello and thanks for attending our talk on From Zero to AB, Swimming Upstream, the Yopto Project, Fairbox, and Rock. So for future watchers of this video, we have uh, put here some abstracts that we had uh, submitted. Uh, a little about us. My name is Ahmed Fatoum. I am holding this um, lecture with my colleague, Roland Hieber. We are embedded Linux developers with Pingotronics. We are a German Linux consulting company, and we help customers with deploying Linux on their embedded systems. We do driver development, kernel development, bootloader development. We do system integration for all these uh, low-level system uh, operating system components. And we also do a lot of graphic infrastructure work, so across the stack from the kernel into the user space. And yeah, some customers, they start with us, new projects. Some others come to us later in the product life cycle. And as such, we see a great variety of systems, each with its own history. And many of these systems use downstream BSPs. So downstream BSPs are BSPs often provided by the silicon vendor or by a module vendor. And they are quite attractive because they work out of the box on the evaluation hardware. You don't have any hardware yet, so you want something to try and run demos on. They come with, demo, uh, with uh, demos. Uh, they are hopefully supported by the vendor for some time into the future, and it's usually available earlier. So like these uh, two cups here that are hunting downstream, they will catch some young fish because the old fish is not upstream yet. Uh, but priorities will often diverge. So the vendor will shift focus on newer hardware. They already started with an old BSP uh, along with the hardware development. And by the time they release the SOC, the BSP is already a bit outdated. They will keep updating it best case, but now your hardware comes and the priorities shift, but you have your embedded product and you need to update. So yeah, your pro the priorities diverge and now you are on your own and you want to do an update. There can be a lot of reasons for that. You want to patch security issues, or you just plain bug fixes. Uh, you want to interoperate with new devices. So these embedded systems can have quite, li uh, quite long lifespans, like 10, 15 years. And you will want to interface with new devices and protocols, which while you implement the protocols, they need quirk handling because they don't implement the protocol exactly. And yeah, the components will get discontinued. You will need to support new components. They are not software compatible. And yeah, you just want to support new features. So you are now tasked with doing an update. So in isolation, how would you update a downstream component? Normally, you would start by defining test cases for update verification. So you can verify that your update didn't break the stuff that you depend on. Then you start looking at these patches that separate you from the version that you were forked off from. And then you look through. Some patches you can drop because you did everything right. You upstreamed it. It's upstream functionality. You don't need that patch on your side anymore. Some are rebased because, well, you didn't have enough time. So you rebase the patch, perhaps give it some love, send it out to upstream. So in the next update iteration, you can get rid of it. But some you need to rework because you depended on functionality that's not there anymore. And yeah, that takes a lot of effort. And at worst case, you must completely replace it because the APIs you, are, you, uh, you used are not there anymore, or you were depending on behavior that wasn't guaranteed to you. But still, it's quite straightforward what to do. You test, debug, fix, and keep iterating on that. But then come real world complications, as is usual with the real world. For one, you have knowledge loss, so people leave the company. And this downstream, this basing on downstream BSPs invites like um, development workflow where you don't write good documentation because you know what the problem is, your reviewer knows what the problem is, you don't need to explain it to somebody else. And then you end up with patches like optimize, optimize locking and it just deletes a spin lock out of the kernel. And now you are tasked with updating that and the colleague isn't there anymore and now you wonder what does that mean? So what was the problem? How can I reproduce this problem? Did, he ch uh, did they check that this 
that this is a safe thing to do, just delete two locking lines out of the kernel. You don't know that, and it's a two-line patch, but it takes considerable time. And that's the good side of the knowledge loss, because you know there is a problem. Then you have these implicit assumptions that you don't know about, and that will eventually break because you depended on something behaving this undocumented way or having this specific order. And this brings you to technical debt. So like this Bear Trap Canyon, you have this technical debt lying around just out there to get you. And it's not just limited to your own patches. It's also the patches of the vendor where you are now the maintainer because you want to update them. So if you have 200 patches, that's a lot for you. Now you go to the main, you, know, uh, you need to look at the patches of the maintainer and you have 5,000. And yeah, there are fixes there that will go away when moving to a new versions. There are features there because, yeah, uh, SOC support, for example, that you didn't have before. And there are reverts in there because they also just have limited time. And then when they moved to the old kernel version, they said, OK, we will just revert these upstream changes and replay our old state. And we will get the same result. And it's a problem for future them. But future them is now now you because you are the one maintaining this and especially here we are custom interfaces to user space because um, it takes time to upstream stuff and for good reasons so for example in upstream we have uh, infrastructure like dma buffs where in a gstreamer pipeline for example you can pass around uh, just a handle to describe sp uh, memory and uh, memory range in kernel space that can be moved between devices. So you save memory copies, which is very important on embedded systems that just have not that much resources. Uh, you have this infrastructure in the kernel, but it wasn't there yet when the vendor wrote his software. And what did the vendor do? Well, they just pass around physical addresses. And now your uh, video decoding pipeline has root access. And it's an unsafe thing, it's an unsecure thing. It's a very bad idea. And you are now married to this interface because it's, it's just like a cancer everywhere. You have to use special GStreamer elements. You have maybe to use a special sync. You need to write your application against that, which brings us to the last point. You have some sort of soft vendor login. So it's open source software. You can see the sources, but you are still locked in into this ecosystem. And it works as long as you have these approved use cases, which most customers of the vendor have and which for some time they will keep uh, maintaining but once you go away from that and try to do other things you run into other problems so for example uh, I had a problem where on an older Raspberry Pi kernel for, ni for nine I think the system was locking up after a few weeks and yeah you want to debug that normally you would just write a bug report to the preempt RT developers and tell them, yeah, I have a problem here and that's how I reproduce it, but you are not using upstream. Uh, by far, you are, uh, it's completely different kernel that you are using. It's old, it has vendor patches on top, it has user patches on top, and the problem is probably in your part that they won't maintain for you. So uh, where will you go? The Raspberry Pi Foundation, they do good work, for example, <laughs> on, uh, on like lip camera, but PreemptRT is not a priority to them, and it wasn't something they did. And yeah, they just ha host a branch for the PreemptRT integration. So despite it being a big ecosystem with many people using it, that concrete uh, use case of yours is not covered very well. And now it costs you a lot of effort to try to understand why this happened. Spoiler, it was the fast interrupts in the downstream USB driver. You turn it off, but then it's too slow. And you can just move to upstream to try. Upstream had great rework in that area, but you can't go to upstream and compare what's the performance now. And now you are in a very uh, unfortunate situation because elsewhere you are using all these Raspberry Pi specific APIs and you, yeah, and you just can't use these normal APIs that you use on the desktop. So you, um, so you would benefit greatly from just using the same stuff you use on the desktop on your embedded system. Yes, it needs more work at first, but it pays off in the long, uh, in the long run. Um, so well, what, what if you had a clean slate? If you were back at the drawing board and 
you are doing a new product, what could you do differently to not find yourself in this situation that you start with something and then down the line, and down the line is it's quite a long line when you have 15 years, so you don't want to end up there. What can you do? You should choose hardware that can be supported well. So modern SOCs have such a degree of complexity that you need many thousands of pages just to describe the peripherals, not even the CPU. And, it won't, and it's not even enough then, and there will be missing parts, but at least that gives you a chance to support a system for that long. Because knowledge loss doesn't as just affect you, it affects the vendor as well. They lose source code all the time, people go away, and if you are left without documentation, it's not a nice thing. But that's just one part of the equation. Uh, if, if you have documentation, is there upstream engagement around the platform? If it's attractive to you, it should be attractive to other people as well. So yeah, look, at, look upstream, look at the mailing lists. Uh, do people, what do people write about this platform? Is your board supported mainline? Is there a device tree for it? If not the board, is there a device tree for your SOC? What kind of devices are written there? Are there drivers for this? Uh, if someone reports a bug, who, yeah, does he get, uh, does they get replies to their issue? And is the vendor themselves engaged upstream? So do they want to have a sustainable model where they upstream stuff? And, or do they just live in their downstream world with their 6,000 patches on top? And yeah, with great efforts, they do an update every two years. And that's the kind of stuff you want to look at. And there are actually alternatives that you can use an upstream kernel on and not miss out on too much. Here are some examples from NXP, the IMX, and the Layerscape series. Uh, you must, um, yeah, uh, marketing speak infects that a bit. So the IMX 8QM and the IMX 8MQ, they are completely different SOCs, completely different upstream support, and <laughs> watch out for that. So search, actually, for that what you want to use. Uh, from TI, like this, uh, this SOC family where the Beagle bone is from, from Microchip, Rockchip. These are SOCs that, we, uh, that I had uh, some experience with at work. They work well, you have documentation for them, so there is uh, upstream support. It's not, of course, a complete list, but I can just talk about the things I know about. And that's one part. The other part is you choose hardware to use upstream solution with. Yeah, use upstream solutions too, that's the point. Uh, develop based on the mainline kernel instead of the vendor fork. Try to use um, the interfaces that are provided to you by the mainline kernel and avoid these board specific one-offs. For, yeah, we are embedded, every one is special, but we share a lot of stuff and there is no need to keep reinventing the wheel and have stuff that's only specific to us, which we could use in a future project or someone else could use it, try to upstream that stuff. Not everything at once, it's normal that you have patches, but at least have patches where they are documented, where other people can work with, which in your update iterations can be part by part be smaller. Yeah, and that, yeah, collaborate with the community. So to sum up, uh, <laughs> you have this uh, juicy upstream fish, that's the one you want. And yeah, it's harder at first. You have these upstream currents of sorts, which I can imagine are harder to hunt in than the downstream currents. But you saw the two cups at first, they didn't look very uh, full. Yeah, uh, the big bears hunting upstream, they have more of the juicy upstream goodies. And yeah, that's where <laughs> you want to go. Uh, in theory, that sounds all nice, but uh, yeah, how do you go? Uh, you previously, you had this downstream BSP, which had all things integrated, but now if you want to use mainline, for probably you don't have a BSP where everything is there. So my colleague Roland will now tell you a bit about how it could look like to integrate such an upstream-based BSP, and yeah, we will use Yocto for that, Rauk and Fairbox, and yeah, that will be his part. Oh, well, 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 hello. <laughs> uh, yeah, Ahmed introduced me already. Um, 
we are going to look at a clean slate. And uh, how can this look like? Uh, so you have nothing. You start from scratch. Um, you want to end up somewhere with a functional system that can be updated. And uh, in this uh, example, we're using uh, the Yocto project as a BSP and uh, built on it um, using ROG as a, an update framework, uh, which is fail safe and uh, you, can image, uh, you can do image based updating with it. And um, on, on, under the hood, we're using Bearbox for uh, as a bootloader and also uh, as, we, um, as we will see as a integration with the update framework. So uh, the board we're looking at is uh, from one of our customers. Uh, it's, uh, you, can, you can buy it if you want. Uh, if you talk to Intercom, they will sell it to you. So it's uh, readily available and on the market. It's, um, yeah, it's a SOM with an iMix 8M processor uh, with um, a bit of RAM and a bit of uh, uh, MMC on top of it on the SOM. Yeah. And um, we will look at our example BSP that we <laughs> just coupled together. <laughs> um, you can have a look at it on our, Git uh, on our GitHub um, page there uh, if you want to dive deeper into it. Uh, but um, I will also share a lot of the source code on the slides here. But let's first look at the architecture. We have some kind of bootloader. Um, in our case, as I said, it's Bearbox. Um, it has this, uh, do we have something like a pointer here? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'll just use this. Sorry for the people on the stream that won't see my laser pointer. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it has some kind of state information um, that is used to um, switch to one of two system partitions. So um, in one system uh, partition, there is a full rootFS, and in the other, there's also a full rootFS. Um, and we are using uh, one, uh, in, in the one partition, we are using rock install to install um, an image into the inactive partition and if we then boot into the other partition by evaluating this state in the bootloader which Rauk uses to switch the active partition then um, we can boot into the new partition and if everything works well uh, some if the system comes up basically um, and uh, you have um, some sort of I don't know, system D service in our case, it's usually uh, that calls this uh, rock status mark good command. And this basically cements this, this bootloader switch. So the bootloader knows that this partition is, can be booted. And there's nothing wrong with it. So uh, this Bearbox day, there's a lot of code here now. <laughs> but all I want to uh, have you look at is um, that it's basically a device free blob. And you have a state node here and um, a SD partition here, which you can use as a backend for your, oh, I have nice arrows for that. <laughs> so the, the state partition refers to, uh, sorry, the state node refers to the state partition as a backend. And the rest of this is basically the variables that you want to have in the state. So we have, uh, one variable for the remaining attempts of the system partition, one for the priority of the system partition, and the same for the other system partition, which I have spared you here because it didn't fit on the slide. <laughs> and then we have a flag for a Bearbox to know which partition was uh, recently booted, so it can know what to switch to. Or in case of user space, uh, Rauk knows which partition it needs to write onto. Uh, and then you have this alias node, so you bless this device tree node as a state node. <laughs> um, from user space, it looks like uh, this. You can use Bearbox state util from uh, our DT utils to dump the state. And yeah, this is on top here is the Bearbox side, and on, on the bottom is the user space side. So you basically see the same variables. Okay, so we need board support for Bearbox and Linux. We need a device tree with Bearbox state node. 
we need, on the other hand, in our BSP, uh, two layers, one machine layer with an image with two partitions, uh, a bare box recipe and a Linux recipe, and a small, very small distro layer which contains our raw recipes and a bundle. So you start from scratch, right? So what do we do? Well, you just build on Pokey. That's the easiest thing to do. Uh, instead of using some pre-configured thing, uh, which you don't understand, which has 5,000 patches on top of it. So you just check out Pokey. You grab your uh, meta layers as, for example, Git uh, submodules. Um, for this uh, case here, we will need uh, the open embedded core meta layer, uh, the meta PTX layer, which um, contains uh, the DT utils and uh, the bare box. And then we also need uh, meta rock for rock support. Uh, yeah, and then you just uh, source your build end and uh, add your layers to BB layers conf. Um, the board support layer is very simple. You can just, uh, if you don't know it, you can just use a bit bake layer tool to create it and it will create you a nice recipe, uh, nice recipes example too, which you can just delete. But yeah, that's just a quick reference slide if you didn't know that. Um, so uh, we need some kind of machine. Um, and on this uh, slide here, I've shown you a minimal set of variables that you need to yeah, need to set for your machine to be workable. So you said basically here, this, this first block is uh, you define uh, which tool chain you're using, uh, which uh, SOC and uh, therefore uh, processor you're compiling for. And uh, you can just use this uh, predefined uh, include files from Pokey and uh, set the right variables uh, so these includes do the right thing. Um, then you have these uh, machine features. Uh, yeah, you can predefine uh, basically a set of software that lands in your device, uh, in your image on your device. And um, yeah, uh, on the end we also have an image configuration file which we'll later use to um, define our two partitions. And continued, uh, we will just set our preferred pro um, kernels and uh, DTB and bootloader packages. Uh, we also need to define um, the dependencies for our uh, bootloader, as we will see later on the next uh, slide. And uh, yeah, that's basically everything. So um, you were using this nice vendor BSP, which does everything for you. Um, as it turns out, our IMAX 8M needs some kind of boot firmware uh, to start and uh, a trusted firmware uh, too. Um, in this case, the trusted firmware basically starts the processor on the um, IMX 8M, and the firmware is used to uh, train the DDR for link training. And these are um, basically, yeah, downstream binary blobs that you just have to use. There's currently no alternative for it, uh, it's uh, questionable if you want to build an open source alternative for it, or if you even can. So uh, yeah, you are stuck with something from the vendor BSP, but it's only basically these two recipes that you can uh, fork from the meta freescale layer. And it has also the advantage that you can uh, control, um, basically stay on an old version if the new version, version doesn't work for you yet. Uh, yeah. So, um, our bare box recipe. Um, we have on the left here, uh, I've uh, printed the state of the, uh, of the uh, directory, which is, uh, which is already, uh, what is all in there. Uh, we have these BB appends here, uh, which we use to um, basically uh, put our patch in, our single patch. Uh, so yeah, the BB append just uh, appends this patch to the source URI and uh, well, you need this patch. This is uh, from the mailing list. Um, a colleague of mine did the work for supporting this, um, this, BS, uh, this uh, SOC upstream. Um, if you didn't know, you can just use uh, B4 on the URL. Uh, it's a 
yeah, it's a lower instance like the kernel uses. And uh, most of the board code is uh, basically auto-generated and really, really simple boilerplate. So you can, if you are using this yourself, if you are doing this yourself, you can really, um, you can uh, just use the uh, boards that are already supported in Bearbox and yeah, use them as boilerplate. And we have some uh, environment variables too. You can just uh, put them in the device, uh, in the uh, directory here, and the Bearbox recipe will pick them up. Right. Um, here we are just copying this firmware image uh, to our Bearbox device tree so Bearbox can pick it up and start the machine. Then uh, we need a device tree too. Um, the device tree was already. Um, already existing. Uh, we had a device tree for, for this board. So uh, device tree, the device tree um, recipe for that is really simple. You just uh, include or inherit the device tree uh, BB class and everything works as intended. You have a kernel too. Uh, as Ahmed already said, everything is already supported mainline. We have a device tree already. So uh, the Linux kernel can just use the device tree and initialize our hardware. Yeah. And therefore, our kernel recipe is really simple too. It just inherits the kernel uh, BB class, sets the version, yeah, and sets the compatible machine. So uh, Yocto knows which machine it is compatible for. Okay, so we basically have half of it, I think. We have a Bearbox recipe, a Linux recipe, our board support is there, and a device tree with Bearbox state node. So let's see the image with AB partition partitioning is also really simple. You just have two partitions in this config file. Yeah, and that's it. So we need RAC support too. Um, we are using Meta.org, which has already has the uh, recipes for RAC itself and a bit of support for, uh, yeah, copying uh, the, the system conf etc. And uh, there is also this uh, MetaRock community layer, which we have on our GitHub uh, organization, which contains support for other platforms as well. So if you're using this for your new, bo for your new board, then you can just use it as an example uh, and see what you need to do. Uh, in this example, we want uh, to do it ourselves. So <laughs> we will see what to do. And uh, we're basically creating a new layer. As I said before, you can use the bitbag layers tool and uh, really minimal distro conf for it. So you set the distro name and the distro version and also use Rauk as the distro features. Okay, we need a bundle too. Um, a bundle recipe is also fairly simple. Um, you inherit the bundle class that comes from Meta Rauk. Uh, then you define basically your uh, your slots which you want to have. In this case, we only have two slots which are both named rootfs. So rootfs uh, a uh, rootfs one and rootfs two are both kind of the same image. So you have these uh, rootfs as a rock bundle slot, and you define which uh, image you want to put in these slots. In this case, it's just the usual core image minimal from Pokey. And this next part is um, configuration for our cryptography. Um, there is a nice script, which I think I had on one slide, but I don't know where it is. Well, uh, <laughs> if you uh, know OpenSSL, you can generate these on the fly, but um, there's also a script in the MetaRock community um, GitHub, which generates these keys for you. And of course, uh, you don't want to put your private key into Git, but that's just what I did here to show you how to do it. Right, and then we have our system conf, which basically um, defines what we want to have, which slots we want to have, which keyring we want to check against if we uh, want to update the, the, uh, the image. So uh, Rauk won't install anything yet. Uh, it will only install things that are assigned by the right, uh, yeah, by the right cert, basically. 
Yeah, and then you say uh, where your slot lives, uh, slot A lives, and where your slot B lives, in which block device. Yeah. So we basically have everything we need. We can do Bitbag update bundle and be very happy about it. And I think that's all we have. Other questions? I think we have a second micro somewhere. Well, are there any questions? Hmm. Yes, please. Sorry, uh, why not include the IMX layer? Because potentially you might need to change the ARM trusted firmware, which we've had to do. Um, yeah, we don't use the IMX uh, recipe for as uh, IMX ATF recipe from the Meta Freescale layer. That's a downstream trusted firmware. We use the upstream one, so it's not actually a blob. It's built from the upstream repository, and the Meta Freescale layer wouldn't help us there. So the only dependency we have is just the firmware. And the Meta Freescale layer has uh, questionable stuff they do in their layer conf with like SOC overrides. And it's just a dependency I don't want for a single recipe. Yes, it's something, it's one thing you need to take care of when you do updates. But I would rather import one recipe that just downloads a shell script. It's, it's basically a shell script installer that's downloaded. It doesn't build anything from source. This uh, firmware IMX uh, recipe. No, you, you can change the source for. We've had to. We've had to patch. No, the ATF. I. I am not talking about the ATF. Oh. I am talking about the firmware IMX. That's the only thing that we imported from the Meta Freescale layer. The trusted firmware we built from the upstream repository, okay. not from the NXP sources. And for secure boot, does Bearbox uh, support HAB? Yes, Bearbox supports HAB. I have seen it running it's on the IMX6 platforms, on the IMX8 MQ. I haven't myself did it, uh, done it on an IMX8 MM, mm -hmm. but yeah, the infrastructure is there. Cool. Thank you. And it's integrated into Bearbox. You don't actually have to mess with it in the BSP. It's, it's nice. And as I said previously, um, you sometimes you want to be able to control what goes into your image and which firmware you are actually using. So for example, in, uh, in one of our customers' uh, case, we had um, the case that their user space application didn't work with the new firmware, uh, with the new, um, either the ATF firmware or the, the new uh, DDR firmware image, firmware uh, blob. So um, when, you, when we, were, we were updating from uh, an, an old BSP to the new Kirkston release, they changed the firmware to a new version and our user, their user space application broke. So yeah, we basically ended up doing the same thing, forking the recipes to a layer, yeah. Any other question? <coughs> well, if that's it, I thank you for being here and yeah, check out the GitHub repository, give it a try. It's not complete. We hacked it here in the speaker lounge a few rooms <laughs> next to this room. So feel, f feel free to send pull requests or if you have questions, just contact us. It's Thank you. Extra content. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.